Hey, Pastor Carl here. Thank you so much for joining us online. We pray that you are refreshed and encouraged as we dive into God's word together today. Thank you, team, for leading us. Oh, my goodness. It is unbelievable how God has built up a culture of, of, of uh, creativity and artistry and music here. I'm just so grateful that God has, uh, God has done that work in us. A couple quick things. If you don't know me, my name is David. I, uh, I'm your site pastor here at New City. Really excited to share with what God has put on our heart as a church um, with you today. It is, we are super, super excited. Just a couple things. Um, on your chair, you should have seen uh, like a little card and maybe you sat down on it and you broke it. Shame on you for not paying attention to your chair. But um, we've got these cards and it's all the information that you need for Christmas Eve this year. If you are going to be with us on Christmas Eve, it's not gonna be here. It's gonna be out at Riff Road, one church, Three services, one Christmas. It is going to be really, really great out at Riff Road. And, um, and honestly, every service will be full, so make sure you get there early. We'll talk more about it as it comes. But we've got two churches dumping all their energy and all of their creativity and all of their resources into one, uh, one service at three services, and it's going to be super, super good. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. Big, big surprise, right? We're going to be talking about Jesus on Christmas, but we're going to be approaching it from the lens of the, the greatest life that has ever lived is calling us to live our greatest life from here until eternity. So it's going to be amazing. A couple quick welcomes. John and April, welcome back from your honeymoon. We're so glad you are tan and that you experienced the sun and the sand and the beach. I'm not actually happy that you got to go there, but I'm happy that you are back, whatever that means. Okay. Um, you might notice, uh, but for real, welcome back. How was it? Awesome? There were three thumbs up there. This is really good. John, you got one? All right, perfect, perfect. Um, Wendy, welcome back. We're so glad you're with us today. Uh, Mindy, welcome back. We know that you had some surgery this past week. We're really glad that you're with us. Um, who else? Aaron, welcome back. I don't know where you are. You're, hey, Aaron, welcome back. You got the light just shining from heaven right on your face right now. This is amazing. We've got, if you, if you didn't, couldn't tell, like we have a lot of people here and first service um, drew through some shade because they were a little sleepy still. But listen, it was packed here uh, at the 9, and it is full at the 1045, and we are so glad that this is your church. Here's something I'd like to, for you to consider on the front end. We need your seats. Would you ever consider going to Sunday night? Just want you to roll it around. We have a 6 o'clock service on Sunday nights. No child care, so I know that changes some things for some of you. But if, if you've ever been rolling around like, hey, maybe it would be fun to do brunch first and hang out in the morning with family and then go to church at night, we would love for you to do that because we, we have a lot of open seats on Sunday night, but we don't have a lot of open seats on Sunday morning. And so if that's you, one of the reasons we started a Sunday night service was to create room for people to come in, and, um, and it hasn't really worked yet. And so... If you're thinking about checking it out, we'd love for you to check it out, um, but no pressure, because we love you here too. We might just have to bust down this wall and see what happens. <laughs> Who knows how to break down a wall? Does anyone know how to break down a wall? This is good. This is good. We can make this happen. Anyway, okay. All right. You guys ready for some scripture today? Yeah. Awesome. Last week, we started a mini-series here at New City um, that will take us into Advent called Church People. And, and the big idea behind it was that there is a whole lot of us who are new to the faith. They are new to church, that maybe we didn't grow up going to Bible camp. And so there's all these things that we don't know. Um, like we know, we know that we're saved for heaven and we got that, but we don't necessarily know how to be faithful today. We don't know how to follow Jesus in our everyday. And it's like we're saved and, and we're secure, but in the meantime, there's all these unspoken, often unknown characteristics or cultures or norms that go along with being a Christian, with being church people, um, that some of us still need to learn. And so that's where we started, this big idea of like, who are we? Who are we? Who are we made to be? And that's where we started last week, looking at the early church in Acts chapter 2, people that literally walked with Jesus on earth, that created this new culture, this new church that we were, that we are stepping into. And, and what we saw from Acts chapter 2, I think the overarching theme was that the church for these people the church was a place to belong. More than anything in Acts chapter 2, we have people from all over the known world, all these different people, and, and no, more than anything, they all found a place to call home. And that's what, that's what God is calling us to as well, as church people. That this is a place where we as the church can become all that we were meant to be because it is a place for us to belong. And that's what we saw. A place to belong, a place to become. It's a, it's a place to love and be loved, 
This is the expectation, right? Love and be loved, serve and be served, give and receive generously, and live together. Know each other faithfully in community. This is what it means to be church people. This is what's available to you as God's people, but it's also what's expected from us as the church, that we would, that we would find a place to belong, but that we would also build and create and step into this place to belong. That you not only love, uh, that you not only be loved, but that you would love. That you not only serve, but be served. That you not only receive, but that you would give. This is the expectation, and it's also available. Well, as we continue today, I want to build on this idea of belonging, the church, by talking about what comes next, about who God is leading you to become after you call a place home, after you have decided to belong. With all that's available, all that's expected from this life that God wants most for you. And, and, and I know that this is kind of a big question. Like, wow, we're going to talk about who God wants us to be. God's dream for us. I know it's a huge topic to try to make sense of, but have you ever wondered what God actually wants for you? Have you ever tried to process what God's will is for your life? Like, like again, you know you are secure forever. You know that you are safe for heaven. You know that this is your destiny. You know that your story will wrap up in eternity. But today and tomorrow and next week and next year, have you ever asked yourself, am I actually doing with my life, with my days, what God wants me to do? Because with all of the options before us, right, good things really good things. All the options before us, all the possibilities of what we could do and what we could go and, and who we could be, man, it can be really hard, at least it was for me, it can be really hard with confidence to find a place to, to park, or find a place to land. So how can we know with all that's out there, how can we know as the church, as God's people, what God actually wants us to become? Well, as I was thinking about this today, as I was I think for a lot of us, especially new believers, I think we, we start this process, we start to process this question of who does God want us to be and what does God want from me? As we do, I, I've seen that we often settle, instead of asking what God does want, we settle for what God doesn't want. And I, and I don't know where this comes from. Maybe it's, again, from the vastness of this available future in front of us. We get a little intimidated. Or maybe it's, you know, just easier to, to, to follow a list of don'ts than to step into a, a life of do's. But listen, I've seen it in me, and I've seen it in you, and I've seen it in the church as a whole, where we start to fashion, and we start to build our faith primarily on the foundation of what God says no to, instead of setting our expectations for what's possible on where God says yes. Has anyone ever been there, like, stepping into building a life uh, just by avoiding or removing what's bad, but never really working to embrace or fill your life with what God says is good? Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me, because there is absolutely, uh, it's absolutely true that God wants you to avoid what is bad. God wants you to avoid what's wrong. God says, go and sin no more. Absolutely, Right? This is what following Jesus is all about. But here's what I need you to understand today. As we're talking about who God wants you to become, not who you are, but who, you want to, who he wants you to be, what I need you to remember is that God's dream for your life, God's greatest dream for your life is more than just a lack of sin. God's greatest dream for you, this side of heaven, it goes far beyond what you simply abstain from or what you choose not to do. God is leading you into a life of abundance, a life of possibility, a life of opportunity, and a life of saying yes to Jesus. God is leading you into a life of less, yes, and that's because God doesn't want your future to be defined by what's missing, by the lack of something, what's absent, but rather by what's present and active and moving. Yeah, God wants you as a church to, to obey when he says no, but that's only half of the story, right? He also wants you to obey when he says yes, when he calls you into something better. And that's what we see in the book of Romans chapter 12, when Paul writes that, that God, God tells us to hate what is evil. That is a no-brainer, right? Hate what is evil. And we got that. I think so many of us got that, but a lot of us get stuck there. And it starts to shift into our own uh, understanding of who we are and what's possible in our lives. Because we see the evil in us and we say that nothing is possible. So Paul says in Romans chapter 12, God tells us to hate what is evil, but he, but he doesn't stop there. He also tells us to, to cling to what is good. 
that, that no isn't enough and there has to be room for yes. And, and listen, a life of faith isn't just a life without sin. It is a life full, abundantly full of God's presence and promise. Where religion stops with no as we strive to be good enough on our own, self-righteous on our own, strong enough on our own to be good, where religion stops saying no, true faith begins by saying yes. As we submit all we are to the power of God within us as he leads us into his goodness. God never expects you to be good enough on your own. All that God wants for you is that you would step into his goodness. So if you're taking notes today, that's the first thing I need you to remember, that a life of faith is not just a life of less bad stuff, but it's a life of more good. It's a life of saying yes, because again, you have to remember that if you simply remove all the garbage from your life, and I think some of you have been here, if you simply remove all the garbage from your life, but never replace it with something good, then what will happen? Yeah, even with the best of intentions, even with the strongest of convictions, even with accountability partners calling you every 25 minutes, the garbage will always come back. And that's because if you don't remove, if you only remove the bad, it leaves a hole in your life. It leaves a hole in your heart and your soul and in your mind. It, 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 this exposed gap that demands to be filled. And if you don't fill it with what is good, it fills itself with what is bad. It reminds me of this past summer, um, but a year what about a year and a couple months ago, I started to feel this pain in my mouth. Some of you know that, that this happened. Um, and so I went to the dentist and I got one of the x-rays. Isn't it interesting that they put this, that really heavy mat on you and then they leave the room and they just expect you to feel okay with it? <laughs> anyway, so I'm there and I got the thing in my mouth and I got the mat on me and they take this x-ray and they come back and they're like, wow, this is, this is really crazy. I've never seen an abscess that big in someone's face. Help me understand what that means, dentist. And so they said, basically, there's this massive infection underneath the tooth that I had a root canal in 20 years before. Now, long story short, what happened is that 20 years ago, 20 years before, I went in because someone threw a football at my face, broke my face, and, um, and I had to have a root canal. When they did it, apparently a piece of the drill broke off into my tooth, and they never took it out, okay? Yeah, it's awesome. And then, and then when they filled it in and they tried to finish it, all of that all of my tooth stuff was still down there and it just started this infection, right? And it was a 20 years of infection eating away my jaw. Insane, right? So I head over to, I know, this is amazing. I got a picture of it. Check this out. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But I, I went over to a specialist. I went over to a specialist after the dentist because the dentist was just, he kind of did the emoji like this, like, I don't know what to tell you right now. Um, <laughs> And, and the, the other guy, he said, oh, yeah, you know, we see this every once in a while, but, but here's the plan. I said, first of all, we got to get the garbage out. I said, okay, this, sound, this sounds great. And he's like, basically what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cut open your jaw, your, your gums. And the, the word they use, and I never want to associate any, med if anyone's in medicine right now, never use the word scoop the infection out, Okay. <laughs> Just got to scoop it out. Just scoop it right out. And I'm like, oh, okay. So the idea was they got to go in there. They got to scoop out the infection, get it all clean. And then he says, but that's not, that's not enough. It's not enough just to remove the garbage. He says, then I, I have to pack it with this good material. Because if I don't pack it, this empty gap that your infection left behind, it will fill itself with more infection. And isn't that what we're seeing here? Just so you know, everything is fine. I'm good. I'm good. But this is exactly what we're talking about. If you don't fill the gaps in your life that sin left behind with what God wants for you in your life, the gaps will fill themselves with all that God says no to. The gaps will fill themselves with all the garbage that you had already cleaned out. And I just need you to understand that God wants so much more for your life than this chronic cycle um, of digging out the bad just to have it fill itself back up again. God wants so much more for your life, and yet I have to believe that some of us here today, we are dealing with that exact same problem. Where you are with God, you are saved for eternity, you have confidence in this, but there is still this habit, there's still this addiction, this sin issue, right, that you just can't seem to shake. 
And no matter how many times you clean it out, it just keeps coming back again. It leaves you feeling defeated and lost and, and, and so far, right, from anything that resembles God's will for your life. I know I've been there. I think we've all probably been there, but here's the deal. If that's you, if that's you, you just need to know that nothing will change in this pattern until you replace the bad with good. You cannot just hang out at neutral. You have to move into the black. No discipline will last. No program will fix it. It's not until you fill the gap in your heart, your soul, and your mind with what God says yes to that you'll ever, ever be able to move beyond your past. And that's, I think, what we see here in John chapter 10 when Jesus says the life that he came to bring, right? He, Jesus says that he came to bring life and to the full. And this is not just for the good people. It's for all who believe. He came to bring new life for you and for me and not just a life of average, not just a life of sitting around, not a life of getting by, a life of no, 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 always looking back, trying to keep the sin out. I feel like half the time we, we, we carve that, that sin out of our life and then we try to build like barriers around the hole instead of just filling it with something good. Now see, Jesus said he came to bring a rich and satisfying life for all who believe, a life of abundance, not only focusing on the past, not only focusing on the failure, on the no, but also stepping into the freedom, filling the gap with goodness. This is what Jesus says he came to bring. And we see this life, this life of yes, God, yes, God, with the church um, clinging to what is good. We see this reflected all throughout our New Testament, second half of the Bible, right, if you're new. Um, but I think Paul, the apostle, the writer of most of the New Testament, he really gives this beautiful description of what this life looks like and what it entails um, in this letter to the Colossians, the same one that Pastor uh, Drew was reading earlier. So if you have your Bibles, here's the word, here's the scripture for today, Colossians chapter 3. And we've got a lot to read, so I just want to get right to it. We're going to be starting in chapter 3, verse 1. It'll be on the screen. It says this. Since you, as God's people, since you have been raised to new life, since you, as church people, have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Listen, if you are dealing with, with always falling back into your pit of sin. This is the first step right here. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life that God wants most for you, your destiny, this side of heaven, is hidden with Christ in God. So verse 5, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Again, I think I'm just, I, I, and I've been here too, but I just get, I, I'm blown away how surprised we are when our life starts to suck, and yet we exist in these patterns. I'm just blown away how this is a surprise to us. He continues, verse 7, You used to do these things when your life was still part of the world, but now it's time to get rid of all anger, rage, Malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off, you have removed, you have cleaned out your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And stop there, okay. Because I'm sure you're seeing this and you're like, hey man, I thought we were talking about the future. I thought we were talking about good things, positivity, right? This is cool. And all I'm seeing is a lot of no's here. Okay, cool. I'm glad you noticed. They all matter. They all matter. Because Paul, again, he's like, hey, hate what's evil. This is what's evil. Hates what's evil. Put to death your sinful, earthly lurk, things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater. And, and you know what? I, I'm so happy, as Paul is reflecting this, hate what is evil. I, I'm so glad that he included things that are outside of like what we would typically associate with sin. Because as a church, right, I think sometimes we just, we completely miss the boat with things like greed. Entire careers are built around being greedy, and we as God's people, man, we, have, we don't even think twice about it. And yet here's God's comparing greed with evil things, with, with, with lust and, and impurity and sexual immorality. He's, he's putting it all under the same camp, right? He's saying, hate greed because greed is idolatry. You're worshiping things of the world and not God. And that's just heavy. And, and it made me think as I was reading through this passage, I just kept thinking like, man, I wonder what he would have added to the list if he wrote it today. 
I wonder what he would add to the list if he had wrote it today. But anyway, the list goes on in verse 7. He said, you used to do these things when your life was still part of the world, but now it is time to get rid of all the garbage, all the anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old life and all its wicked deeds. And, and so that's heavy. It's intense. It's a lot of no's over and over and over again. But I hope that you catch the encouragement in the midst of the rebuke. Because I think what Paul is saying here is that, that, that nothing here is conditional for these people to be saved or for them to be loved by God. No, he is calling them to put to death the sin that's lurking within them because they are saved, not to be saved. He's calling them to live the life that they were saved to have, to, to live the life that God is leading them to become. He says, you used to do these things when your life was still part of the world, but now you are different because Christ has raised you into new life. You are different. You used to be a part of the world, but, but now you have been stripped of all your sinful nature. The garbage has been scooped out of your life and all its wicked deeds. And because of that, Paul says, you need to act like it. This is what it means to be church people. Have nothing to do with who you used to be. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. And that's what we see in verse 3 when he says one more time. He says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Hate what is evil. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Where Christ sits in the place of honor. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ. And listen, if, that, if you're taking notes today, that's the first piece I need you to understand of stepping into this life of yes, God, yes, God, yes, God, to know what God wants for you. It's the first step because you died to who you used to be. You died to this old life. God raised you up. And now Paul says, think about the things of heaven. Think about the things of heaven. If you want to move beyond a life of no, then you need to be thinking about the things of heaven. Verse 10, he continues, he says, put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and what? Become like him. Put on your new nature so you can learn to know your creator and become like him. You need to think about the things of heaven. Verse 12, since God chose you to be holy people, he loves, you must clothe yourself. This is the yes stuff. This is the forward movement. Clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is the life of yes. This is who God is leading you to be. It's holy people. Holy people defined by the fruit of the Spirit living within you. Not defined by your own efforts, not defined by your own goodness, defined by God's presence in your life as he has filled you, uh, it, it defined by mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, the ways of Jesus. And then verse 13, he says, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, this is the end, verse 14, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from God, this is what Pastor Drew read earlier, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Always be thankful. This is who God saved you and is leading you to become, not just who God is telling you not to be. Okay? It's not just about the no, it's about the yes. God says, hate what is evil, but as you remove the garbage, as you dig out the sinful, earthly l things lurking within you, listen, you need, to, you need to remember, it's going to leave a hole in your life. As you dig out this garbage, it's going to leave a hole in your heart and in your mind, in your desires, in your habits, in your hobbies, in your bank account. It's going to leave a gap in your life that has to be filled or will end up filling itself. Because garbage comes back. But Paul tells us, and this is what's so cool. Paul tells us, don't just keep digging. No. Don't live a life where you keep scooping out the same infection. Now think of the things of heaven in verse 16. And this is the best part. He says, and let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your life. Don't keep scooping out the infection. 
Don't build walls around the gap. No. Let the message about Jesus, let the good news about Jesus fill your life. Let his mercy and his love and his humility and his confidence, his priorities and his practices let Jesus fill the gaps that your sin left behind. Paul, and this is so cool. Paul's like, listen, let love, let love fill the empty space that love, lust left behind. Let, let peace fill the empty spaces that fear and worry left behind. Let compassion fill the empty space that judgment and condemnation left behind because your old life is gone. Your old life has been, has been cast away as for, the former ways have been put to death. All your no's are gone. The anger, the malice, the rage, the slander, the dirty language, the deceit, they've all been stripped away. But it's left all these empty places in your life. Some of us don't even know how to live without anger. Some of us don't know how to live without lust. Some of us don't know how to live without greed, but see, this, it's here in these empty spaces in these gaps that need to be filled. It's there that, that Paul says your faith begins. That your life of yes begins as you let Christ fill you and lead you forward. And more than anything, like we just read in, in Colossians, more than anything, this is who God wants you to become as a people. He wants you to become like him. After all the garbage is gone and Christ fills your life, you are more and more like him every single day. This is his will for your life, that you'd strip away the bad and replace it with the goodness, the goodness that can only come from God. And you know what's so cool is that this is what's available for you. This can be you. This can be your life, but it's also what's expected of you in, in return. That you would say no, but not again to maintain your good standing with God. You would say no, and you would cast aside all of your past. But not to, learn, not to earn love and forgiveness. No, no, you say no to sin. You say no to the past. You say no to those evil things lurking within you. You say no so you can say yes to Jesus. You dig out that evil. You dig out that garbage so you can replace it with something good. And this is it. You say no to self. You say no to the world. You say no to sin. You say no to your past so you can embrace and say yes to Jesus. As he leads you from here into your greatest possible end. And listen, next week, Jeremiah is going to wrap up this conversation on church people, and he's going to talk more about um, some of the practicals for how we actually do this, okay? For how we stay faithful in this process, how we live as holy people, how we live set apart and, and step into this life he expects from us, okay? I get that. But as we finish up today, I just, I, I wanted to get into that, but as we're, as we're finishing up today, I'm just, just sensing this need to park on this idea, this reminder that this life that God has for you is available. A life is available because I think for a lot of us, man, we have, we have gotten so used to only saying no. We have gotten so accustomed to only saying no that we've forgotten that, that a life of faith starts by saying yes to Jesus. And I'm not trying to project on anyone here, but, like, but I know that some of us here, we've gotten so used to managing our failure Digging it out, building gates, building walls to keep it coming back, but it still comes back. We've gotten so used to managing our failure that over time, even though we know better, this pattern, it, it's led to all we believe is possible. This side of heaven, it's just going to come back again. Got to build, big, build a bigger wall. Got to get better accountability partners. We've gotten so used to thinking that this life of no is all there is. We just exist barely in this endless loop of digging it out only to have it come back again and again and again where we're always reacting to our weaknesses. We're always limiting ourselves by our past. We're just damning ourselves till eternity by the habits we just can't seem to shake. I see it. I see it here. I've seen it in me. But listen, this distorted view of faith and repentance and sanctification, this life of only saying no to, is not what Jesus had in mind when he said he came to bring us life to the full. A life of abundance, a rich and satisfying life. No, God wants so much more for you. He wants you to experience real freedom 
and real hope and joy. God wants you to reset your expectations for what's possible, knowing from Romans 8, right, that there is there no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There is no there is no condemnation, and because you belong to him, the power of God, the life-giving spirit, Romans 8 says, um, it has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The power of God, and I, you need to remember this, the power of God has freed you from the power of sin and death, and this power, it wants to lead you forward. It doesn't want to make you look back. It wants to lead you forward from here until eternity in ways that will absolutely blow your mind. in ways that will absolutely blow your mind. But that means you have to stop digging. You do not have to earn God's approval. You already have it. Put down the shovel, break down the walls, and let the good news of Jesus fill your life. This is what it means to be church people. Put down the shovel, break down the walls, and let the good news, the salvation of Jesus, fill your life. And again, next week we're going to be talking more about how we actually do that. But today as we wrap up and the band comes, in response to all we've heard, in response to this life of yes, I just got a, I got a question for you to roll around as we respond in worship and, and, and just existing in this time with God. I've got a question for you and I've got a challenge for you. First, the question is this. What do you think might happen in your life? Just think about your life. What might happen in your life if you let the good news of Christ fill it? What might happen in your life if you let the good news of Jesus fill the gaps that sin left behind? What might happen in your eternity I make no assumptions of who's here. What might happen in your today if you said yes to Jesus? And, and maybe it's for the first time here. And now, how might things change in your life? Um, if you, like Colossians said, if you set your sights on the realities of heaven, how would you change? How would your decisions change? Consider for a moment. How would, how would, how would you change? How would your family change? If you put to death the sinful, earthly things living within you? How might your family grow and change? In your relationships, what would happen if you chose to exchange lust for love? With your friends or at work, what would happen if you chose to exchange anger for peace? This is a decision you make to fill the gaps that sin left behind. What would happen in your heart and in your vision for the future if you finally stopped digging and started to believe and see through the world through the lens of, yes, God, I believe you're for me. What would happen if you said, God, I, I believe that you love me. I believe that you already paid the grave for me. Yes, God, I, I want a life of yes. I trust that you will lead me to my greatest possible end. Think about it for just a moment. Who would you become? Who would you be? As you follow life into Jesus into a life of yes, who would you become? That is the first question for you to roll around today. Who would you become? Would you like to see that person? Yes. So here's my challenge then. After all of this, after all of this, after all of this, what's available, what's available, a life of yes. Hate what is evil, love what is good. Listen. My challenge for you is I just, I beg you, say yes to Jesus. God, God will never beg you to believe, but I will. Because I truly believe that, that you will never find a greater life, a greater hope or purpose or love or freedom or peace or reason for living than when you commit to a life of faith following Jesus and being filled by his spirit. And even beyond that, more than what you might expect this side uh, uh, of heaven, even more is the reality that your days are numbered and you will die and eternity is real and God, he wants you to be there. 
He wants you to be in heaven with him, but he will not beg. He will not beg you to come, so I will again. Because it's this important. Say yes to Jesus. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your life. There is no reason to wait. Let today be the day you move forward in your faith to move past this life of self-induced limitation, these ceilings that you have built over your own story. Put down the shovel, break down the walls, and step into a greater way with Jesus. If you have been living with all the guilt, all the expectation, all the law, but none of the grace, say yes to Jesus. If you've been living hating what is evil but never clinging to and being filled by what is good, then here and now as we worship in this moment, say yes to Jesus and listen to shift in your spirit. This isn't a box to check. Saying yes isn't a script to recite because in the end it's all about your heart. It's a shift in your heart and mind and soul. It's just a decision you make to let Jesus fill your life. But at the same time, in my own story, in my own experiences, there is something so incredibly powerful about taking physical steps forward in faith. Of drawing a line in the sand to say, like, I, I never want to go back to that old way. I need you to hold me to it. I never want to go back. I never want to go, I never want to pick up that shovel again. I want the spirit to fill up those gaps. And so listen, whether you've been a Christian for 20 years or 20 seconds, or you are still on the fence. You are still building the wall around your, that, that hole in your life. Man, if you want more from your life with God, if you want to become who God, who God died to save you to be, if you want to step into this way, if you want a life of yes to where God is leading you, then I just need you to simply say so. There's a card underneath everyone's chair. And we've got a whole pile of them up here today. It just as a life of yes. A life of yes. And this is an opportunity for you. Again, you could, you could be a Christian for 40 years or you could, you could have never understood any of this before, but we all can take a, a step this morning. We can all leave the past behind, put the shovel down and step into a new life today. And I know this is just, it's just a piece of paper, but your heart is attached to it. Your mind and your soul is attached to this. And so if you want to step into a better life, if you want to let the past go and you want to move into something better, I just want to encourage you, write your name down. You might be thinking, well, well, why, what's, what's the point? If it's, I want to pray for you. We all want to pray for you and we want to hold you to it. So as we go, the band is going to lead us in response. But as the band leads us, I just want you, come on down. If this is what you want, if you want a life of yes, you want a life of purpose and significance, then grab a card. Write your name down, and at some point during the next couple songs, bring it. Bring it forward before, before God and the church as we celebrate this life that he has saved you to live. A life of yes. And so I want to pray for you right now, and then we'll respond in our worship. God, we love you, and we thank you. God, we are so grateful all that you are leading us into. And God, we trust you. And so with all these cards that are just sitting right underneath our chairs, God, we just ask that you would speak something into us as we, as we sign our name on the line. As we commit to a life of yes, of more for your name, for your glory. Spirit, change us, move us, speak to us, lead us from here into what's next. God, we believe that you are you are good, and you want to fill us with your goodness. So God, one more time, just help us purge the garbage out. Put down the shovel, break down the wall, God, and fill us again. Fill us again. We're not enough unless you come meet us here in this moment. And it's in your name that we pray. And we all said, Hey, thank you so much for joining us in our podcast today. Uh, if you are looking for ways to partner with us here at Community Church, you can check out our website at community-church.com.